Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be back and to see all these faces present uh, to enjoy what the Lord has to say, uh, to say to us. And I believe the Lord is a God that is so present in time of need. Don't you believe that? If you believe that, say amen. 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 So it doesn't matter what's happening around the world. God is with us and he is willing to feed us exactly what we need for time and for eternity. Anyway, we would like to say welcome to our online audience as well. And we are so glad you are back joining us as we stream live from Wachita Hills College campus with our seminar, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, where you have been taking in an amazing adventure through Bible prophecy. And tonight is going to be another powerful night. So please stick around. And for you that are local as well, if you have pen and paper, get ready because the topic is going to be a very powerful topic. Uh, the speaker today is... Maboshe Makesa, and the name of the sermon today, the topic today is cleansing the temple. That's very powerful. But there is two things that we will do before we will hear from Maboshe. And that is we'll pray, and then we're going to have uh, special music, and then we'll, after that we'll go right into the message. So please let us kneel as we pray if possible. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for bringing us together in the middle of the week to remind us of the amazing love that you have for us, to remind us of the cleansing that is needed to be done in our hearts, Father. Please send your angels to stand right by us, your spirit to communicate to us, Father, that which we would not hear otherwise. Forgive our sins, prepare us as our hearts need this message and speak to us. Put words in the mouth of my Boshi, Father, to speak to each and every soul present and for those watching online. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. All right, friends, again, the topic for today is cleansing the temple. And before that, we are going to hear a special music. Thank you so much for joining us.
Praise the Lord. I am so happy that although we are not in a world where everyone speaks the same language, God still finds a way to speak to every single person's heart upon the face of this earth. Are you happy for that? It is truly a blessing to behold God's love. And we have been beholding God's love through many different topics. Um, We looked at God's firestorm, which seems like a topic where you can't see God's love, but even there, God's love is seen. And then we were able to see the beauty of heaven and the gift that God has for us, for his children when we go up to heaven. And this evening, we are going to be talking about God's house. God's house. And the title is entitled Cleansing the Temple. Cleansing the Temple. You know, this is a very special topic to my heart. It is definitely one of my favorite topics, and God really wants to share something very, very important with us this evening. And the Lord put on my heart for us to just go to our knees, and for all of us to just spend about a minute or so in prayer, and just ask God to prepare your hearts to receive what He is trying to share. And friends, I say what He's trying to share because every speaker who comes behind this podium, there's nothing special about us except for the fact that we're created in God's image. So I have nothing of my own to share, but the Word of God has something to share to every single person who is listening this evening. So let's go to our evening, just go to our knees and let us pray, and then when you hear my voice, we will open. Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so grateful for the opportunity again to speak for you. And Father, you know that my heart is deceitful above all things. But Father, I'm so great. I'm so grateful, Father, that your son Jesus gives us new hearts. And Lord, this evening, I'm just asking that you'll give us your Holy Spirit. Give me your Holy Spirit, Father. And help me to be able to communicate what it is that you want us to hear. Please protect our minds from being distracted, Father. Protect my words from saying something that shouldn't be said. And I'm so thankful again, Lord. I'm very excited to hear your voice again. Speak through me, O Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to look at God's house, but specifically, we're going to look at two things. One of those things, we're going to look at the joy of the judgment. The joy of the judgment. Those are two words that people in Christianity don't usually put together, joy and judgment. Judgment usually sounds like a scary thing, but tonight we're going to see how it's a joyful thing. And we're also going to answer the question, what is Jesus doing right now? Right now, as we all sit inside of this room, what is Jesus doing inside of heaven? The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, it is who who died. Say it again. It is who? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of who? Of God who also makes intercession for us. So the Bible says that Christ died and he rose again. And it also says that he's interceding for us. What does this exactly mean? The Bible also says in Hebrews 7, verse 25, therefore he is also able to save to a little bit. To the uttermost, those who come to God through him, he always lives to make intercession for them. Friends, the Bible says that Jesus always lives to intercede for us. The Bible describes Jesus in Hebrews 7, verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, and undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. When we think of a high priest, friends, that takes our minds back to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament was described something known as the sanctuary. And the sanctuary was made, according to this verse, Exodus 25, verse 8, and let them make me a what? A sanctuary that I may do what? that I may dwell among them. You see, friends, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, we were separated from God. 
The Bible says in Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, your iniquities have separated between you and I. But the beautiful thing about it is God made a sanctuary, a place on earth to help us to come back to him. The Bible says in Psalm 77, verse 13, your way, O God, is in the what? In the sanctuary. So the purpose of the sanctuary is to help us to find our way back to God. It's like a GPS, But I've heard some people say it's God's plan of salvation. And friends, we're going to dive deep into the sanctuary this evening. Actually, not too deep because you can go so deep in the sanctuary, but we're going to go as deep as time allows us to. Amen. So we're going to look at the sanctuary and we're going to go back and we'll see what what was it that God was trying to do. And when we look at the sanctuary, there's three different pieces, three main parts of the sanctuary. You have the outer courts and you'll see that out here. And then you have the holy place and you have the most holy place. And as we look at the sanctuary, as we see what God was trying to do, first we're going to examine the furniture of the sanctuary. But just to give you a little preview of what the sanctuary was like, the original sanctuary was about 15 feet by 45 feet. And not only just that, the walls were made of upright wooden boards set in silver sockets. And it was also made, the um, the roof was made of four different coverings, linen, goat hair, ram skin, and badger skin. So God was very specific in how he designed the sanctuary. But as we go in, as we go, as we keep going forward, in the outer court, you have the what? The altar. And the purpose of the altar was to bring your sacrifice. Friends, the whole sanctuary points to Jesus. And the Bible says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. As the people were coming to the altar, they were bringing their lamb. And not only just that, after the altar, they had the laver. And the purpose of the laver was so that when the priest was getting ready to not only just make a sacrifice, but to go inside of the next part of the sanctuary, he had to cleanse himself. And friends, that reminds me of 1 John 1 verse 9, where Jesus says he's going to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Isaiah the prophet says, wash you and make you clean. We're thinking of Jesus as we go along the whole part. But now as we go inside the next portion of the sanctuary, you have the holy place. And in the holy place, you have three pieces of furniture. How many pieces? Three pieces of furniture. And the first piece of furniture is known as the table of showbread. The table of showbread was representing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. We saw that in our first presentation. And you know how Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. So as you came inside the sanctuary and you went into the holy place, you saw the table of showbread. But not only the table of showbread, you also saw the seven branch candlestick, the lampstand. And you know what's interesting? What is the purpose of a lamp? To shine? to shine light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And when we have Jesus inside of our hearts, we are now sent out to be the light of the world. People are able to see Jesus in us, but not only was the lampstand there, but also the altar of incense. Have you guys ever smelled incense before? When you smell something good, it brings a good feeling to your heart. It's like, ooh, that was refreshing. Friends, the altar of incense represented prayer. And Paul said, we should pray without ceasing. There's never a time where Jesus does not want to stop hearing your prayers ascend before the throne of God. As you went to the altar of incense, and as the priest would go to the altar of incense, should we say, the priest would offer basically fragrance. And as the prayers of the saints were being presented, it's basically showing how God wants to hear us, how how our prayers to him are a sweet-smelling savor. But now we leave the holy place and we go into the most what? The most holy place. And the reason this is called the most holy place is because of the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was something known as the testimonies or the law of God. And that's really what made it the most holy place. And friends, Another reason why, in the book of Psalms, chapter 80, verse 1, the Bible says that God dwells between the two cherubims. It's the most holy place because this was the place where God came to dwell. So we have the courtyard, we have the what? The holy place, and we have the most holy place. All right, friends, you have to follow along this evening. So this is what we know as the sanctuary. And the person who built this sanctuary was Moses. The Bible says, and see to it that you make them according to the what? 
to the pattern which was shown you in the mountain. You see, friends, Moses made a pattern that God showed him. But look at what else God says about the sanctuary. It says in Hebrews 8 verse 1, we have such an high priest who is where? Who is set down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. A minister of the what tabernacle? The true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So Moses was asked to make the sanctuary that God showed him according to the pattern. And is Moses a man? Yes. But God is saying that there is a true tabernacle. And friends, when you, someone says the true tabernacle, they're implying that there is something else outside of that one. And where is this tabernacle? Where is Jesus right now? It says he's at the right hand of the throne of God, and that is where? In heaven. So friends, there's a true tabernacle of God in heaven. Not only just that, the Bible says in Hebrews 8 verse 5, the copy and the shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the what? To the pattern shown you in the mountain. A shadow is designed to point you to an actual object. So in order to understand more about the sanctuary, that God is in heaven, to, or more to understand what Jesus is doing in heaven, we have to look at what the sanctuary was doing here on earth. What were the priests doing in the sanctuary here on earth? And friends, that is what we're going to explore. Amen? So now we're going to look at the book of Leviticus chapter 7 verse 1. The Bible says here, they shall kill the trespass offering and the blood thereof shall he sprinkle round about the altar. Friends, when the priests would come, they had to sprinkle blood. But what was the purpose? We're going to keep reading. In Jeremiah 17, verse 1, the Bible says, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their hearts and upon the what? Upon the horns of your altar. So the reason why the priest on earth had to sprinkle blood was because of the sins of Judah. So as a result, they had to go before the altar and they had to present the blood. And the reason why we saw this before, because the book of Leviticus tells us that, the light, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So in order for the people's sins to be forgiven, blood had to be sprinkled, blood had to be presented, blood had to be shed. And friends, this is very, very interesting because there was so much blood in the sanctuary service. There were so many sacrifices, but we're going to see why. What was the purpose of all of this? The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the what? Than the heavens, who needs not daily as those high priests to offer sacrifice, for this he did how many times? Once when he offered up himself. Friends, the priest had to go and present blood on the altar of sacrifice, wherever it may be, for the sins of the people. Jesus is the true high priest. And when he goes in, and when he enters the sanctuary service, he presents his scarred hands. The Bible tells us that he is graven us upon the palms of his hands. It's almost as if he goes before the throne of God and he's presenting his hands before God and he's saying, Father, look at my blood. Look at my blood. It's amazing, friends. Every single time we ask for forgiveness, Jesus is presenting his hands. And you know what's interesting? When you read in the Old Testament, they had to make a sacrifice for thanksgiving. They had to make a sacrifice for ignorant sins. They had to make a sacrifice for almost everything. And I would wonder as I read this, I was like, why are there so many sacrifices? But friends, if it wasn't for the sacrifice of Jesus, you wouldn't be able to eat the granola that you ate this morning. If it wasn't for the sacrifice of Jesus, you wouldn't be able to get up out of bed. You wouldn't have the sunshine out in the sky. You wouldn't have the rain that falls to the earth to give us the grains and the fruits and the, and the nuts and the vegetables. If it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, we would have nothing. So God was trying to put in the children of Israel's minds, it's because of my blood that you have every single privilege that you have here on this earth. Amen? What a beautiful, beautiful privilege. So as we look at the sanctuary, we are going to see something else that had to take place only once a year. And go with me in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. Another part that took place in the sanctuary is being revealed here. And when we look in Leviticus chapter 16, we're trying to understand what is it that Jesus is doing in heaven? 
And we're trying to see that if we can see what they were doing here on earth, then we will have a better understanding of what it is exactly that Jesus is doing as our high priest in heaven, because there's a true tabernacle in heaven. So therefore, we can get a glimpse into what Christ is doing. Leviticus 16, and we're going to look at verse number 12. When you get there, say amen. Amen. In verse number 12, the Bible says, And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from of the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. Pause. The mercy seat here being spoken of is speaking of the Ark of the Covenant. We didn't talk about this, but on top of the Ark of the Covenant was something known as the mercy seat. So let's keep on reading. The Bible says in verse 14, And he shall take of the blood of the what? Of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the what seat? The mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger four times. Seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Now pay attention to verse 16. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the what? Of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. Friends, the purpose of all of this was to make an atonement for the sins of the children of Israel. But first we're going to see what part of the sanctuary did this take place in. If you look in Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 3 through 4, the Bible says, And after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the what? The holiest of all. You guys don't sound like the holiest of all people. It sounds like the what? It's called the what? The holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant. So friends, the place where they were going was inside of the holiest of all or in the most holy place with the Ark of the Covenant. And we see here, friends, that there were two purposes that they were doing this for. The first purpose was in Leviticus 16, verse 19, and he shall sprinkle blood upon it with his finger seven times and do what? and cleanse it and hollow it from the cleanliness of the children of Israel. Friends, he had to cleanse the sanctuary from the children of Israel because of the constant sinning that was taking place every single day. Daily, the priest had to do this. But the second reason he would go into the holiest of all was for on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to do what? To cleanse you that you may be clean from some of your sins from all your sins before the Lord. The second reason was so that you could be cleansed from all your sins. Friends, this was a serious, serious thing. And you can see how serious it is in Leviticus 16, verse 29. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or of a stranger that be among you. Friends, only once a year would this take place. On the 10th month, on the seventh day of the 10th month, the, the priest would go into the holy saw, into the most holy place, and he would cleanse the sanctuary. But the, pulp, the purpose of this was not only to cleanse the sanctuary, but also to cleanse the people's hearts, to cleanse them from all sins. And friends, this is so, so beautiful because they had to spend this time searching their hearts, afflicting their souls. And it was a serious time. There wasn't any regular work taking place in the tabernacle of the congregation, but the people were really doing some heart searching. It was like an investigative judgment was taking place. In 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 the original Hebrew, this is called known as Yom Kippur. And this was the day of atonement where the children of Israel basically spend time examining their hearts because if their hearts, if their sins were not confessed and forsaken, they would be cut off from the people. And friends, remember, we're trying to see what is Jesus doing right now inside of heaven. Friends, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, and gives us an insight into this. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. The Bible says, and the temple of God was opened where? 
in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there was lightning and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So friends, not only was there a time of judgment taking place on earth, but John the Revelator also saw a time of judgment taking place in heaven. And with the book of Revelation, it's interesting because to understand certain parts of Revelation, you have to go to another prophet, and that is Daniel. In the book of Daniel, Daniel gives us an insight into what takes place when it comes to judgment. The Bible says, I beheld to the thrones were cast down, and who? The ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came from before him. His, and from before his, thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The what was set? The judgment was set and the books were open. So friends, we see how there was a time of investigative judgment that took place on earth with the children of Israel, how they had to examine their hearts. But the Bible also tells us that the same thing that took place on earth was actually taking place in heaven as well. And friends, this is really, really interesting because it's a sobering time. When you think of thousands and thousands of angels and 10,000 times 10,000, when I did the math for that, it was about 100 million angels. And they're all coming together and they're all doing this for the purpose of judgment. It's a serious thing. But when did this judgment take place? When did the heavenly temple get cleansed? If it took place on the earth, then we know that it's going to take place in heaven as well. Look at what Daniel said in Daniel 8, verse 14. Unto how many? 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Friends, Daniel was told a prophecy. He was told that unto 2,300 days, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And when he was told this prophecy, when you look at the context, he was also told the reason why this would take place. And there was so much taking place in Daniel's heart that he fainted. Have you guys ever heard something so sobering that it almost makes you want to pass out? That's never happened to me, but I can imagine how Daniel was. In Daniel 8 verse 27, the Bible says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. After this, when you look in Daniel chapter 9, this vision was so sobering to Daniel that he just went and he started to pray. Have you guys had experiences in your life where something so serious takes place where you just go to a room and you just start praying? Daniel had the exact same experience. And when he was praying, he was confessing his sins and he was confessing sins on behalf of the children of Israel and he was pleading with God. But while he was pleading, something took place. And Daniel 9 verse 21 through 22, Gabriel being caused to fly swiftly touched me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you. Friends, did Gabriel come slowly? Did he just walk to Daniel? The Bible says he came swiftly. Friends, that is a promise for every single one of us. Whenever we are praying and pleading to God, don't think that he's going to take a long time to hear your prayers. Even if you don't hear an answer immediately, he's heard your prayer immediately. You might not hear the answer. You might not see the answer, but God knows. Amen? And it's the same thing with Daniel. It took place with him. And basically, Gabriel came and was going to give him something pertaining to this prophecy. He came to give him an interpretation. He came to help him to understand it. And the Bible says in Daniel 9 verse 24, 70 weeks are what? Are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of the sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to seal up the vision and the prophecy. Friends, the, that, word, that word determined in the Bible means cut off. It means what? Cut off. It's very important that you guys pay attention at this point because we're going to go through some things that is going to cause you to reason. Remember how I said at the beginning of our presentations that we're going to need your Bible and you're going to need your brains because we have to think through the scriptures. So the, in the Bible, this word determined means it was going to be cut off. But cut off from what? 
Friends, the only other prophecy mentioned before this in the, in the context of Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 8 was the 2300-day prophecy. So it's cut off from that prophecy. But the next question we have to ask is, what was the starting point of this 2300 days and 70-week prophecy? Friends, we are getting ready to see something so powerful. By the time you're done seeing this, if there has been any doubt in your mind that Jesus is real, or that he was the Messiah, the person who was able to save us, then by the end of this prophecy, you are going to be solidified in your own heart by God's grace that Jesus really is who he says he is. Amen? Amen. So the Bible, we're trying to figure out what's the starting points of this prophecy. Daniel said in Daniel 9 verse 25, the angel said, should I say, know therefore and understand that from the what? The going forth of the commandment to restore and to build what place? Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now, friends, the Bible lets us know when this actually takes place. Gabriel is letting us know that from the going forth to basically restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, this is when this prophecy is going to begin. So is there anywhere in the Bible where the going forth to restore Jerusalem was actually talked about? In the book of Ezra, chapter 7, verse 12 through 26, we're not going to have time to read through all of it, but it actually talks about this whole situation. And we're just going to look at verse number 13. The Bible says, Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra, I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel in my realm of their own free will to go up to where? To go up to Jerusalem. So friends, the Bible tells us when this actually took place. And it's interesting because it tells us that who was king? that Artaxerxes was the king. But not just that, if you look up here, it tells us when Artaxerxes was the king. And there went up some of the children of Israel in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Now this is very powerful because when the Bible gives you a specific time, guess where you can now go to see if that time is true? To history. So all we have to do is go to history and we have to see when did Artaxerxes become the king? And then we have to see the seventh year from then, and then we will start to get some answers. So I'm trotting along through the scriptures, and I'm going through history, and I'm going on Google, and I'm looking, okay, when was Artaxerxes put in place? The, 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 we're actually told in history that the, decree of Art, that the decree of Artaxerxes was basically given in 464 BC. No, not, 46, not, not the decree, but Artaxerxes was placed in, on the throne in 464 BC. Now it's interesting, when you go online and you look this up, you're actually going to see that he was placed on the throne in 465 BC. But the unique thing about the way they did their times as far as determining when a king was reigning, they basically started their Jewish years in the fall. So he was basically placed on the throne, let's say it's kind of compared to me coming to college, and let's say I start my freshman year in the fall. What month do we start freshman year here? We start in August, correct? But then you go to your spring semester, and is it still my freshman year? Yes, it's just the second semester. The same thing with Artaxerxes. When he was placed on the throne, it was 465 BC in the fall, but it carried over into the, into the next fall of 464 BC. So it was still the first year of his reign. Does that make sense? Amen. Praise God. So we can see here that by looking at history, we see that Artaxerxes was placed on the throne in 464 BC. But not only just that, we can now see that if we take seven years from there, we will come to 457 BC. And we're told in Daniel 9 verse 25 that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So if you're like me, you're probably wondering, what in the world is seven weeks, three score and two weeks? Are those literal weeks that the Bible is talking about? Yes? No? What do you guys think? No, they're not. But these have a meaning in prophecy. Friends, the Bi first of all, when it comes to three score, that basically is just another way to say 60. One score is 20, so three score is 60. So the Bible is basically saying 62 weeks plus seven weeks, that's 69 weeks. But in the Bible, in Ezekiel 4 verse 6 and Numbers 14 verse 34, one day 
is equal to one year. So it's basically, not one day is equal to one year, but when it's speaking of a day, it's talking about a year. So we're going to try to break this down. So we have 69 weeks that has been told us in the prophecy, correct? But look at this. I, I tried to label it for you guys. So how many days are in one week? There's seven days. So now to figure out how many days are in seven weeks, we simply just multiply by seven. Friends, who knew that we were going to come to a prophecy seminar and learn math? Isn't it amazing? Praise God. God is so good. He can teach us math in the Bible. So we have one week is seven days. Seven weeks is 49 days. That's the first week of the prophecy. That's the first portion of the prophecy. And then we have 62 weeks. 62 times seven is basically going to get us to 434 days. But we saw that a day in Bible prophecy means one year. So keep that in mind. So it's not 434 days, it's 434 years. So now when you add 434 to the 49, the first part of the prophecy, you get how many days? 483. Now this is really, really powerful. God is giving us very specific numbers. And now we simply just do the math. So we see 457 AD, which was basically when Artaxerxes gave the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, and we subtract that from 483. Now, why are we subtracting? And that should actually say 457 BC. But why are we subtracting? When you look at, a, when you look at BC, when, it was basic, when BC was taking place, in order to keep going forward in years, the numbers didn't go up, they went down. Everyone knows that. If you look 457 minus 483, we get to 26 AD. But here's the thing. When you're counting down in years, is there a year zero? There is no year zero. So you have to add one to account for that year. So friends, when we're looking at this, we come up to 27 AD. I know that might have sounded a little bit confusing, so I'm going to go through it again. So we have 457 BC, which was when Artaxerxes was received the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. We take 483 years and we count all the way down and we go to 26 AD. But now we're saying, wait, there's no year zero, so I have to add one. So now we get to what AD? 27 AD. Was there something that took place in 27 AD? Let's keep finding out. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says now in the 10th year, in the 15th year of the reign of, of, of Tiberius Caesar, Jesus also being baptized and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily form. Friends, this is very, very powerful. Now we go to history again and we look at Tiberius Caesar. And then we go to history and we find that Tiberius Caesar was put into office or he was starting to reign in 14 AD. And friends, when you look at this in 14 AD, you might do the math. You might say, OK, if I take 15 years, because that's what it said in the 15th year, if I take 15 years from there, you're going to come to 29. But it's the same exact thing with the way they did it with Artaxerxes. They started their years and the Jewish year was basically started from fall to fall. So when you're starting Tiberius Caesar's year, it was actually talking about how it started in 13 AD and then it went to 14 AD. That was still a part of his, that was still a part of the first year of his reign. So then you go from 14, from 13 to 14, that's the first year. And then 14 to 15, that's the second year. And you keep going down and you can do the math on your own fingers and you'll come to 27 AD. And friends, it's interesting. The Bible says that Jesus was what during this time? He was baptized. Friends, in the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 37, the Bible says that word you know after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And it's interesting, baptism for Jesus in this context, when the Holy Spirit came upon him, that was a sign of him being anointed. When we go back to the prophecy, the Bible said that time was given to anoint the most holy. So friends, the exact time of Jesus' anointing was prophesied hundreds of years before it actually took place. Friends, that is powerful. 
That's why after Jesus was baptized, the Bible says in Mark chapter 1, verse 25, that Jesus said the time is fulfilled. So we have the exact time of when Jesus was baptized. We have the exact time at the beginning of this prophecy. What was to take place next in the prophecy? The Bible says in Daniel 9, verse 26, after three score, we saw that three score means 60. After three score and two weeks, shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Friends, the Bible also says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week, he shall do what? Cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So friends, in the middle of this week, how many days are in a week? There's seven days. So if you were to cut seven in half, we know it's an odd number, it's going to be 3.5 or three and a half. So three and a half years after 27 AD, that's going to take us to 31 AD. And that was when Jesus was what? Was crucified. So we have the exact day when the prophecy started. We have the exact day when Jesus was anointed. And we have the exact time when Jesus was crucified. It just keeps getting better and better. But not only was Jesus crucified, Jesus, after he was crucified, Jesus was trying to do everything that he could to save his people. Amen? But he sent people off. He sent people out to go and reach out to the people of, to the Jewish people. And he was saying, go and reach out first to the house of Israel. And he was, they were preaching to them. And as the disciples were preaching to them, one of those people who were preaching to them was Stephen. But they rejected Stephen. They didn't want to hear Stephen. And Stephen was stoned. And that basically marked the end for the Jewish nation as a people, as being God's chosen people. So after this time, the gospel basically went out to the Gentiles. And that's when God started trying to reach out to the world. So when Daniel was given this prophecy, he was amongst the Jewish, he was amongst the children of Israel. So that's why it was so important to him. And that's why he was pleading for his people. But we see that it comes all the way down to AD 34. And we basically have an outline here of everything that we've seen so far. But now that we see in AD 34, there's still a certain part of the prophecy that is left. When you take 2,300 years or 2,300 days and you subtract that from 490, which is the total amount of years that this prophecy has covered, you come up to a specific number, and that is 1810. And friends, it's interesting because when you add 1810 to 34, what year do you get? 1844. So we go back to the, original, to the original prophecy that Daniel received, and he said, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Friends, we saw that the prophecy started on time. We saw that Jesus was anointed on time. We saw that Jesus was crucified on time. And we also saw that the time for the Jewish people to receive the gospel, that was prophesied on time as well. Friends, 1844 is when Jesus moved from the holy place and entered the most holy place. Remember, we saw on earth that there was a time when the high priest would go into the holiest of all. So now we're trying to see what did Jesus do in heaven? And that was when the Day of Atonement took place, the anti-typical Day of Atonement, and this final phase of his ministry. This began the investigative judgment for us on earth. Friends, what were the children of Israel doing during this time? Were they running around the camp and just having fun and saying, oh, wow, it's such a wonderful day outside? Was that what they were doing? They were afflicting their souls. They were searching their hearts because they were trying to see, are my sins confessed? Have I repented of my sins? Have I given my sins to Jesus? And friends, the same way they were doing that, that says something for us. And friends, does the Bible talk about a time when the judgment began? Revelation 14, verse 6 says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting what? Gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? His judgment has come. The Bible says that the judgment has come. The hour of his judgment has come. But you know what's interesting? It says that this is a part of the everlasting gospel. Friends, that word gospel, do you guys know what the word gospel means in the Greek? It means good news. Is the judgment good news to you? 
Is it good news when you hear that the judgment has taken place? Or is it something scary? Friends, what takes place in the judgment? Why might it not be good news for us? Or why might it be good news? The Bible says in Revelation 20, verse 12, the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. And what was written inside of those books? In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Friends, you know, being a Christian openly is one thing. It's one thing to go to work every single day and to say hello and to talk about Jesus, but it's another thing to be a Christian inside of your heart. God knows the thoughts that you think. He knows the things that you're talking about inside of your mind. He knows how you are inside of your room when no one is looking. But friends, are we talking about Jesus with our friends privately? Are we thinking about Jesus in our hearts? Is our burning desire to share Jesus with as many people as possible? Because if that's the case, then the works that we're doing are going to show. Christ is going to work in us to willing to do according to his good pleasure. And it's going to be good news that the judgment has taken place. The Bible also says they shall be judged by the law of liberty. Friends, when we look at the law of God, can we look at the law of God and say, man, I know I'm cherishing a sin in this area. Are we rejecting the law of God? Is it truly a law of liberty to us? Is it something that we enjoy? Friends, if we see that that is not the case for us this evening, there's hope. The Bible says in John 2, 1 John 2 verse 1, and if any man sin, we have a what? An advocate. Another word for advocate is to say a lawyer or someone who's standing up for us. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Friends, if you see that your sins have been inside of your heart and you've been holding on to them, if you see that the judgment is not something you look forward to because you see there's certain character traits that you just don't want to let go of, or you're not allowing Jesus to put you through the trials of helping you to go through those, to take care of those character traits, then we can look at Jesus who is our advocate. And we can look to him and have hope and say, Lord, please help me, plead my case, give me strength to actually do that which you want me to do. That way we can truly look at the judgment as good news. Amen? And the last verse, friends, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Friends, God is asking us to turn away from our sins. That's what repentance means. And when we turn away from our sins, it is only then that Jesus can truly blot out our sins. That he can plead our cause before the Father and say, Father, look at my blood. Look at what it is that my children have done. We can look hopeful at the judgment. Jesus is our advocate, he's our judge, and he's our faithful and true witness. And friends, as you guys listen to this song, have hope. Have hope that the judgment is not something that you have to be afraid of, but Jesus is doing a work for you. It can truly be a joyful judgment. Mm -hmm. We have a high priest up in heaven, hallelujah, oh hallelujah, he's our defender before the Father, in a temple made by God, not man. Behind the veil, in a place most holy, hallelujah, oh hallelujah. Investigating, he clears the record of those redeemed by him. provision for me in the sanctuary he's purifying heaven's temple hallelujah oh hallelujah in preparation for his return 
for those who love and follow him. He's blotting out my sin in the sanctuary. He seals my bond with provision for me in the sanctuary at the mercy seat in the holy of holies in the holy of holies we meet he's bloody you to imagine that you have a house and you just bought this nice house and you spent so much time trying to make sure that this house was clean. You did everything that you could, you knew that people would come over to the house one day, and you did everything that you could to keep it clean. And you know that nice feeling that you get? When you look at a clean house or a clean room or anything that you've ever cleaned before in your life, it's a feeling of satisfaction. Did you know that when Jesus cleanses our hearts, there's a satisfying feeling that he has? But now I want you to imagine that your best friend comes over and they just got done mudding. And they went to go play in the mud and they say, my and they run over to you and they hug you and then they go and they sit on the couch and they walk around and they start touching things and there's mud everywhere and not only just that you had just got off the phone with them and just told them how you just got done cleaning the house some of you guys are holding your breath don't even have a house yet but friends Jesus our body our lives we are his house. And when he cleanses us from sin, he doesn't want us to make it dirty again. You know, we have a habit of doing the same things over and over and over again. And he loves to clean, but he loves to keep things clean. And friends, we all know those things that we keep doing to make the house dirty again. We all have them. That's why we're still here on this earth. But friends, how about we make the choice this evening to say, Father, I want to keep your house clean. Can we make that decision this evening? Amen. Amen. Let's kneel and have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for Jesus, and I thank you so much for accepting the offering of service that I have given, Lord, in sharing this message. Lord, I'm asking that you'll pour your Holy Spirit upon the hearers. I'm asking that that which I was not able to communicate clearly, that your Spirit may teach them in their secret places, that you may make it clear to us what it is that you're doing in heaven right now. Help us, Father, to keep your house clean. Please, we need help, Father. We can't do it on our own. And I'm so thankful that we have a high priest who is here to help us. And we ask now, Father, for your Holy Spirit to walk with us, that we may truly not walk 
and dirty places. Be with us as we go throughout the rest of this evening. And we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, if you enjoyed this evening's message, you will not want to miss Saturday's message at 11 a.m. At what time? 11 a.m. Central Time, Joshua Holly is going to be presenting on Bowing to the Beast. Bowing to the Beast. If that intrigues you, if you're wondering, what is this beast? Who bows to a beast? Then you're not going to want to miss Saturday's message at 11 a.m. Central Time. Thank you for being here to listen to God's Word. Have a blessed evening. We are so pleased you could join us here at Watchtower Hills Academy and College. And if you have enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you would like to support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description below. Thank you so much for joining us, and may God richly bless you.